Chapter Ten of Survivors of the Chancellor by Jules Verne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. High crate of potash on board. October twenty and twenty one. The Chancellor is now crowded with all the canvas that she can carry, and at times her topmasts threaten to snap with the pressure. But Curtis is ever on alert. He never leaves his post beside the man at the helm and without compromising the safety of the vessel he contrives by tacking to the breeze to urge her at her utmost speed all day long on the twentieth the passengers were assembled on the poop evidently they found the heat of the cabins painfully oppressive and most of them stretched upon benches and quietly enjoyed the gentle rolling of the vessel the increasing heat of the deck did not reveal itself to their well-shod feet and the constant scouring of the boards did not excite any suspicion in their torpid minds Monsieur the Turner, it is true, did express his surprise that the crew of an ordinary merchant vessel should be distinguished by such extraordinary cleanliness. But as I replied to him in a very casual tone, he passed no further remark. I could not help regretting that I had given Curtis my pledge of silence, and longed intensely to communicate the melancholy secret to the energetic Frenchman, for at times when I reflect upon the eight and twenty victims who may probably, only too soon, be prey to the relentless flames, my heart seemed ready to burst. The important consultation between Captain, Mate, Lieutenant, and Botswain has taken place. Curtis has confided the result to me. He says that Huntley, the captain, is completely demoralized. He has lost all power and energy, and practically leaves the command of the ship to him. It is now certain the fire is beyond control, and that sooner or later it will burst out in full violence. The temperature of the crew's quarters had already become almost unbearable. One solitary hope remains, it is that we may reach the shore before the final catastrophe occurs. The lesser Antilles are the nearest land, and although they are some five or six hundred miles away, if the wind remains northeast, there is a chance of reaching them in time. Carrying royals and studding sails, the Chancellor, during the last four and twenty hours, has held a steady course. Monsieur Letourneur is the only one of the passengers who has remarked the change of tack. Curtis, however, has set all speculation on his part at rest by telling him that he wanted to get ahead of the wind, and that he was tacking to the west to catch a favorable current. Today, the 21st, all has gone on as usual, and as far as the observation of the passengers has reached, the ordinary routine has been undisturbed. Curtis indulges the hope even yet that by excluding the air the fire may be stifled before it ignites the general cargo. He has hermetically closed every accessible aperture, and has even taken the precaution of plugging the orifices of the pumps, under the impression that their suction tubes, running as they do to the bottom of the hold, may possibly be channels for conveying some molecules of air. Altogether he considers it a good sign that the combustion has not betrayed itself by some external issue of smoke. The day would have passed without any incident worth recording if I had not chanced to overhear a fragment of a conversation which demonstrated that our situation, hitherto precarious enough, has now become most appalling. As I was sitting on the poop, two of my fellow passengers, Falston the engineer and Ruby the merchant, whom I had observed to be often in company, were engaged in conversation almost close to me. What they said was evidently not intended for my hearing but my attention was directed towards them by some very emphatic gestures of dissatisfaction on the part of Falston, and I could not forbear listening to what followed. Preposterous! Shameful! exclaimed Falston. Nothing could be more imprudent. Pooh! Pooh! replied Ruby. It's all right. It is not the first time I have done it. But don't you know that any shock at any time might cause an explosion? Oh, it is all properly secured, said Ruby. Tight enough. I have no fears on that score, Mr. Falston. But why, asked Falston, did you not inform the captain? Just because if I had informed him, he would not have taken the case on board. The wind dropped for a few seconds, and for a brief interval I could not catch what passed. But I could see that the Falston continued to remonstrate, while Ruby answered by shrugging his shoulders. At length I heard Falston say, Well, at any rate, the captain must be informed of this, and the package shall be thrown overboard. I don't want to be blown up. I started. To what could the engineer be alluding? Evidently he had not the remotest suspicion of the cargo was already on fire. In another moment the words, pie crate of potash, brought me to my feet, 
and with an involuntary impulse i rushed up to ruby and seized him by the shoulders is there a pie crate of potash on board i almost shrieked yes said falston a case containing thirty pounds where is it i cried down in the hold with the cargo End of chapter 10